Well, welcome to RDWorks Learning Lab again. We're not going to go anywhere near RDWorks today. I've got a, a rather selfish project that I want to complete. Those of you that have been following my series will know that I had trouble with my first laser tube that was supplied with the machine. It didn't perform very reliably and eventually I had to buy a new tube. I still don't understand why my first tube failed. Despite asking lots of very simple questions, why does a laser tube fail? What are the reasons for a laser tube failing? Why is my laser tube producing low power? All those sorts of questions. You would think I'd be able to get some sort of answer off the internet. No, there's nothing out there that provides any answers to, as to why my laser tube has failed. It turns out these simple questions have caused me to jump into some very, very deep water. Some of the answers are buried in scientific papers and I've had to wade through huge amounts of very, very highfalutin scientific papers to try and get some sort of clue as to how this laser tube works and why it would fail. So let's start off by trying to explain how this laser tube works and then we can possibly think about ways in which it can also fail. In this white space here, and also in this pink space down the middle is the gas that fills this tube. Now the only reason it's pink down the middle is because when you apply a very high voltage to it, it turns into a ionized gas stream. But when it's not between these two electrodes at the ends, the gas is actually recirculating back through these tubes here and down to the other end. So there's a circulating gas system in here. When the gas is pink and ionized, it's producing quite a lot of heat. And that heat gets transmitted out to this blue stuff around the outside, which is the water that's running through the system. When the gas is being circulated around the outside here, it's also in contact with the water tube to try and cool it down, but it's also in contact with the outer skin of the glass vessel. So as we've already mentioned, the blue colour here is the water that is circulating round inside this tube. It passes over this green thing on the end here, which is actually a mirror. So then it moves into this plenum chamber at the end here and moves rapidly along an annulus between these two tubes. Exits at the other end here, where it sits around the electrode to try and keep the electrode cool, which is the cathode, and also it then passes out of the system by uh, running round this secondary mirror which is a green mirror but as you can see it's not doing a very good job of cooling the mirror itself because it's hardly in contact with the mirror how does this laser tube work well for it to work it has to have a gas mixture inside here but basically what we need is some carbon dioxide some nitrogen and some helium. Those are the three main gases that are used in all these sealed systems and they're in a ratio of about one to one to eight. So there's a large amount of helium in here depending on which manufacturer it is. They may add their own small traces of other gases as well. Hydrogen particularly and xenon. Well I'm going to make no apologies for what follows. It's going to be a very simplified story of many hours of heavy duty reading. I'm going to go right back to the beginning and we need to just understand for those people that haven't necessarily seen this stuff before. It's all based on atoms and an atom is like a little miniature solar system. We've got a sun in the middle which is called a nucleus and around the outside we've got planets and these planets called electrons operate in little orbits various distances away from the nucleus. Sometimes they're occupied by just one electron, sometimes they're occupied by several electrons. It depends on the chemical, how many electrons, how many orbits. All the atoms that follow will look like this, but they're only representations, not reality. Okay, so that's the essence of an atom, but an atom contains energy. Whenever you see three electrons floating around the outside, you will always have three protons and three neutrons in the nucleus in the sun. And so the whole thing is in electrical balance. Now let's talk about the specific players 
in uh, in this game of laser. Here we've got two atoms which are called nitrogen. These nitrogen atoms don't really like existing on their own. So let's call them twins and they hold hands all the time and that's what the spring is. The spring also represents the possibility that these two things can move apart a little bit and become stretched. But of course if they become stretched they want to ping back together and so you can get vibration in this pair of atoms and that's the whole secret of how the laser works. Now the next players of the game are oxygen. Now we haven't mentioned oxygen as a separate element working inside this tube. That will come in time but let's just understand that again oxygen normally likes to exist as a pair. That's why it's called O2. It can exist on its own under certain circumstances. These twins are not as heavily bonded together and um, they like to party and so they're very happy to team up with a carbon atom and uh, have great fun because they're called carbon dioxide. Two oxygens, one carbon atom, a nice three-way relationship. The thing about this relationship is there are two springs involved, two sets of flexibility. There are all sorts of combinations of vibrations that can take place in this relationship. The oxygen atoms, cover it, for instance, could stretch out to the sides, they could pull into the middles, one could go to the left, one could go to the right, and that's very important for the lacing action. This is, after all, a carbon dioxide laser, and this is the most important molecule in the reaction. Now, the carbon dioxide molecule is not always completely stable, and consequently, as in all three-way relationships, Sometimes one of the partners can get dragged away by something more attractive. And this is a process called dissociation. An oxygen atom can get knocked off and leaving carbon monoxide behind and a free oxygen atom floating around. Now we're just about ready to turn the tube on and this next bit is really going to annoy the purists because my little visual diagrams here which help me envisage what's going on don't represent reality but I hope they will allow you to imagine the process that's going on. Now the first thing we must understand is that gas does not conduct electricity. Gas is basically an insulator and you need free flowing electrons to carry electricity. So if you remember back to the picture of the atom with the electrons whizzing around the central nucleus, there are things that are hitting us all the time. They're called cosmic rays. Now they're very small and they pass right through us. We don't notice them. But atoms don't notice them either. But electrons can be knocked out of their orbit if they get a collision occurring with a cosmic ray. Before there's any electricity applied to this tube there are always a few electrons floating around that have been knocked off of their atoms and as soon as you start applying electricity to these electrodes the high voltage electricity which is positive attracts the negative electrons and the higher the voltage the faster these electrons whiz along the tube here. The way to imagine these electrons whizzing along this tube is a big fat man running right down the centre of a crowded tube train in the rush hour. What effect would you imagine it has? It's a cascade effect. It will, it, it will start off knocking over one person. Those people will knock over other people. The whole thing will turn into chaos. And that's exactly what happens here. Those few free electrons rush towards this end of the tube. And as they rush towards the end of the tube, they collide with other atoms and electrons and knock other electrons off. And so consequently, very quickly, you get a whole cascade of electrons which are flowing in this tube. So as soon as the electrons start to flow, that's when the current in the tube starts to flow. There will very, very quickly become a point in time when this voltage will drop rapidly because this ionised gas is able to carry huge amounts of current. Now, we don't want this gas to carry huge amounts of current, so there is external circuitry in the power supply with limiting resistors which make sure that we don't get huge current flows which will I suppose effectively blow this tube up. Now as we've already just mentioned the nitrogen atoms are already nicely stimulated by the voltage 
and they're bouncing around at a high rate of knots but they don't actually bounce around they're vibrating and that's where this picture technically goes wrong because I'm showing it as a bounce but in fact it's a vibration but you can't show a vibration on a drawing so this is basically representing a high energy level dropping down to a low energy level where it emits pink light and then coming back up again and if it's caught at the right point in time at the high energy level then these nitrogen atoms when they strike the rather lazy and lethargic carbon dioxide atoms they can like a ball kick it into a much high energy level state basically they kick it up onto a shelf an energy shelf and it's an imaginary thing but I've drawn a shelf in here so that you can see it as a physical manifestation of some sort these carbon dioxide atoms are sitting here on this high energy shelf which is not a natural state for them to be in and they're ready to topple off onto the shelf below and then to the shelf below and then back to the ground state. This drop from the top energy shelf to the second energy shelf is what we're interested in because as it hits this second energy shelf that's when it emits a, an infrared photon. Let's just assume that this shelf contains something like a bowling ball. If you were standing underneath that shelf and the bowling ball fell off the shelf onto your head you would feel that energy being absorbed into your head and what would come out of your mouth I'm pretty sure would be a swear word and that swear word is basically a photon the energy is changed from one state to another and it's emitted as a light particle now once this photon has been emitted it's going in any random direction it could go outwards it could go along the tube but sooner or later because this has taken in taken place in millions of instances all along the tube there'll be a point in time where some of these are being dragged along the tube just because of randomness and what will tend to happen is they will tend to cluster and join together this is a bit of a difficult concept for you to imagine maybe how things can synchronize with each other imagine you're at a, a very good concert um, a musical at the end of the show when the curtain drops everybody's clapping randomly you know it's a great noise everybody's enthusiastic about the great show that they've just seen and all of a sudden the orchestra strikes up and the curtain comes up the cast come in for their final bow the orchestra has all of a sudden provided some sort of stimulus to make everybody clap in a synchronized manner now that is what the lacing action is as soon as a few of these photons pass by they basically stimulate these carbon dioxide atoms to fall off the shelf and as they fall off the shelf the photons that are emitted go in synchronization with each other and the and the one that's triggered it okay so now we've got infrared photons zinging backwards and forwards along this tube and what happens is they run out the end here and this green thing is a mirror it's a mirror which will reflect the photons and so the energy gets reflected back along the tube and it hits this green mirror here and as they go backwards and forwards along the tube they knock more and more carbon dioxide atoms off of their high energy shelves and produce photons and this whole process is going backwards and forwards backwards and forwards now if this was a mirror and this was a mirror all that would happen is they would reach a saturation point inside here where you couldn't knock any more photons off. We've got a special sort of mirror at the end here which is called a partial reflecting mirror. Maybe 10 or 20 percent of the photons that hit this are allowed through as a focused beam and so that's what's coming out the end here. That is your laser beam and you can vary the amount of energy that comes out by varying the current flow in the tube here but there are some other things that are taking place in this tube at the same time xenon helps to reduce this strike voltage to a lower level and it initiates this glow phase at lower voltage levels that's what the function of the xenon is as the nitrogen drops down and produces this glow as it crashes into the carbon dioxide atoms and imparts some of its energy to there so we've got heat being generated all along the way and that heat has to be carried away most of these atoms are not very good heat conductors now the helium plays a very important role it carries this heat away and dumps it at the outside walls of the tube on the water jacket 
helium performs a very important role to allow the laser action to carry on.